Greetings, everybody. How nice to have you here with me for Tools for Guiding Student Reflection and Goal Setting. And of course, we're talking about their wonderful language learning experiences. It is my pleasure to be here with you today. I wanted you to see me first. We were, seems to have lost, lost that personal touch in conferences, so I wanted to make sure I took this. But now I'm going to share my screen and we're going to go to the conference. Okay, so here we go. And let's see here. And okay. So thank you very much for joining me for Tools for Guiding Student Reflection. This entire presentation is on getting students to reflect on their own learning. Because as you can see to the right on this screen, engaging them, engage them in the growth process and they will amaze you. Get them to be part of it. I am Parthena Dragget. I am in Florida right now. Um, and I have spent 39 years in world language classrooms, 35 of those at the high school level and four of those at the university level. Before I go to the next screen, I want to stop for a minute and think about this. This is called Global CRED, which stands for Credentialing and Recognizing Excellence and Determination. It's the determination that we are going to focus on today. So here you see me, this is kind of my journey. Uh, to the left, the picture there is the school in Ohio where I spent more than 24 years, many of those years as department chair. And to the right was my very first year at the Community School of Naples to where I was recruited. I retired from Ohio, came to Florida. I spent all my time in Ohio teaching in public schools. All my time at the community school is a, um, an independent school. So I'm happy to say I have an experience helping build language skills and working on proficiency and vertical alignment and all um, for students in all kinds of schools. And that has been very important. I also want you to look at this, uh, if you'll take a look at this board, this is years ago at Jackson when we first had can-do statements and I was in Ohio and I love the Ohio Department of Education working with wonderful people like Ryan Wirtz and Debbie Robinson and Kathy Shelton because you know we were driving this idea of home of empowering students to what they can do. This is before the successful actful can-do statements. And um, I always see how I posted them because I believe that's important. I'm going to talk about that in my um, presentation. But when I talk about my journey, I have taught language for a very long time. And, you know, from, I hate to say it, the days of grammar translation in the 70s, all the way up through just now I retired. So to, through 2020. And luckily we are the best time ever in world language education. We're all aligned. We're all focused on the same outcomes. We understand that proficiency is what it's all about. That we want our students to truly communicate. This is so important because that's something that has really been at the center of my learning. I am going to, while I'm talking, put earbuds in because I see some people outside that might be making noise and I do not want that to affect this conference. Okay, so I hope you can still hear me okay. I certainly hope so. It is very important that our students be part of this journey. And it was my journey, but it was really making it all about their journey, right? Finding out how to engage them and make the learning of the world language more than just a grade, more than just a credit they need for college or, or you know, along those lines. So my entire career, I was really spent focusing on how do I get students more engaged? Well, to me, engaging them from the beginning and looking at what they're able to do and how to do it better is the key. So, and I think that really came to me through my own reflection, my own teaching early on when I first earned national board certification. But um, one thing for sure is, and I'm gonna say this loud and clear, there has never been a better time to be a world language teacher. I wish I were starting my career with all that we have at our fingertips right now. If you are a person who engages in social media, here are some hashtags for a Twitter, Facebook, whatever you would like to use. I found that Twitter always helps me because when I'm at a conference, whether it's live or whether I'm tweeting from a virtual conference, I find that if I wanna go back and think of what resonated with me, all I have to do is look at my tweets. <laughs> so if that helps you, please do that. So I like to always have my conferences, my presentations guided by essential questions. What is a motivational classroom that inspires learning? How do we engage students to reflect on their own learning and set goals for growth? Because that's really what this is all about. 
And what does student reflection look like? I'm going to show you many examples today. And I'm also going to base some of my presentation on one of my own students in a project that she did. So let's go to that very first question. What is the motivational classroom that inspires learning? If we were live together, I would have you talking about this at your tables together. But for right now, how about we just take a few seconds to reflect in your own minds. How do we define learning when it comes to world languages and, and motivation? So let's do this. Think about first, what is a motivational classroom that inspires learning? Think of what that might look like to you. You can close your eyes and reflect for a minute. And next, think of one word. How do we define learning when it comes to world languages? Think of a word, one word. If you had to bring it down to one word, one word what would that be? I sure wish you could share them with me, but let's move on. So we have come a long way, thankfully. Um, <laughs> this gentleman you probably all recognize from Ferris Bueller's Day Off, you know, that boring um, monotone teacher that just didn't really care about whether his kids were learning or not. And then look at this picture of these students just kind of sitting there. Wow, we have come a long way. Hopefully none of us ever taught when we had students that were so disengaged. I, I don't think of mine ever were like that, but this is happily where we are today. Students are engaged, they're excited, they're, um, in, they're involved. This happens to be a Spanish four class of mine at the Community School of Naples. And this is a student-led discussion. I in Spanish four have student-led discussions that we, it's a big long project. It would take me way too long to explain to you. I actually have done presentations on it. But students come up with the topics, they develop the questions, they lead the discussions, of course, in the target language only. And I sit back, I monitor and note um, engagement of the students and their efforts. That's pretty much it. And they are amazing. Students never want them to end. They love them because we are engaging them. We're making the learning about them. And another way that we do that is helping students to understand their own level of proficiency. We really need to make it clear to them where they are. Learning language is not about memorizing vocabulary and grammar, right? It's about the communication. So this is a poster that I actually had made for all my teachers for their classrooms. I also had the can-do statement you'll see later made for all my teachers in their classrooms. Um, because not only was I um, uh, a teacher for 39 years, I was a department chair. Um, for many of those years in both of my schools, and I help guide them to help their students to get to proficiency. So I look for anything you could do to help facilitate as a department chair. But, you know, getting kids to understand what it means to be a novice learner, that they're the parents, you know, they're the ones that repeat, memorize lists, and um, that they they often just repeat what they've already um, learned, but that they don't often know how to recreate and put things together to make them different. But then we look at how can I jump a level? And we talk to them back to get to intermediate, which is the survivor, the person that can get his or her needs met when engaging with, you know, first with, her, with the language learners, with um, native speakers of the language for which they're learning. They need to speak in more full sentences, keep the conversation going by asking follow-up questions and so on. And how can I jump a level to advance? You know, our advanced are the reporters, the ones that can narrate, jump between tenses, all of that. Those of us that teach uh, students in uh, high schools, we know that we are usually, this we can move through pretty fast, right? Novice, it doesn't take too much to get from novice low to novice high. We spend a lot of time here moving, depending on the skill. And then of course, a lot of time moving through advanced as well. But most of our students probably find themselves by the time they graduate, if they've had a really um, good, well-aligned, articulate program, they find themselves somewhere in here. And hopefully with AP, they get somewhere in here. What do these graphics represent for you? These graphics, I'm going to show you two actually. Okay, I'm going to move myself out of the way here. And I put my in red because my proficiency level means the student's proficiency level, right? We want them to understand this is about them. 
I love this graphic because it really puts communication in the center, but we want to bring culture and stick it right here with communication nowadays, right? And what do we communicate? We communicate in three modes, right? And of course, interpretive means reading and listening and presentational speaking and writing. And interpersonally, we can, you know, write and, and read and write back and forth to other people, and we can listen and speak back and forth to other people. And of course, we want to engage the students in the communities, making comparisons between their community and the target language community. And of course, establishing those connections, not just across um, different uh, language le learning or language speaking communities of the world, but even, you know, cross curricular uh, connections, you know, social sciences and uh, science and technology and English and all of that. Um, a newer graphic, and this is uh, Tyrrell and Clementi. Okay, this is a little newer graphic because it really brings that cultural piece in a little more strongly, I think, because we want to know ourselves, explore communities of the world, and engage with the world. And this little I, 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 this is from one of their publications, but this little I can be me, the I, you know, and you notice this is uh, where it all crosses together here. But I love both of these graphics and I do share them with my students because it really shows that language learning is very complex. It is not just about the communication, but about the culture and about what we communicate about and how we, become, how we develop that interculturality. So we want to uh, do our best to develop a motivational classroom that involves our students in the learning process. They need to be part of it. It is not just us, so why not engage them? These are some things that, that I, for me, define a motivational classroom. Inspires interaction and engagement, gives students the floor and an important creative voice, makes the teacher more of a facilitator or coach and cheerleader for the students, promotes risk-taking and eager participation. And when I talk about that, I think it's really important to have students understand that making errors is important. If they're not making errors, they're not taking risks. I have a lot of posters in my classroom about that about, you know, in Spanish or in French, saying to them that if you're not making mistakes, you're not growing, you're not learning. We need to permit them and, and, and actually even applaud now and then when they take one of those risks, and even if it produces a lot of mistakes, they're taking risks to become, you know, uh, better and make them eager to do that. It focuses on the students as primary, the teacher's secondary communicators. It celebrates each stride, a motivational cl classroom celebrates the strides in each step toward proficiency. As I said before, we allow for errors. We even celebrate them as necessary steps, necessary steps toward learning. And also, I believe a lot in giving students choice in learning and assessment. It is not a one size fits all classroom. It's really important. When I give essays, I give more than one essay topic for students. Same thing when it comes in often when it comes to doing uh, cultural comparisons or pr oral presentations of some kind or when they're going to do those uh, those uh, circular discussions that you saw in the picture of my Spanish for students, they get to choose the topics. Give students choice as much as possible because they need to be engaged and interested. How else do we engage students in reflecting on their own learning and growth? with can-do statements. And you even saw that back in, that was a picture I believe from 2012 in my classroom in Ohio, you know, early on, much before then, I was engaging them with can-do statements because we don't want to be, I can conjugate a verb. We want to be, I can interact with speakers um, about, to, to make a purchase in a, in a store, for instance. You know, that they understand that it's the task and uh, the functions of the language that, that reign supreme. This is, I, I don't know where I ever heard this in the first place, but this is what I always said to my students. There's no elevator to proficiency. We have to take the stairs to get there. One step at a time and really thinking about what we're doing. Making a plan, reflecting, goal setting, so that we can get students that earn medals and certificates and all that. Yeah, that's important, but not all of it. I think what the most important thing is that they focus on why are they earning these medals and getting their certificates because they're becoming proficient. That's the most important thing. It's not about a grade. It's not about an award. It's about what they can do, empowering them to know they can make a difference in the world and in lives of others. If they can communicate with them through the target language that we're teaching them. And as far as the necessful, actful can-do statements, and I believe they were first published in 2017, or the latest version of them at least, 
Notice the middle, because this is right off the ACFA website, Nassessful ACFA, and I believe it's also on the um, Ohio Department of Education website. But notice right in the middle, learners set learning goals and regularly chart their own progress. Through reflection, they identify what it takes to advance. That is the key. Now, it does talk about educators and schools and districts and universities and states and all that, but really it's about the learner. That's the target, right? Yeah, I keep having to move little things. You can't see me doing that, but I am. Okay, so how do we use the can-do statements? For students, they self-assess language proficiency and performance and set goals for how to progress to the next level. And for teachers, teachers use them as predictors of proficiency growth, for setting learning targets, and as sample activities for units and lessons. Because when you really drill down into this document, it's you know, it's pretty hefty. When you drill down into it, you'll see examples of how students can show their proficiency and growth, which also give you examples for how to develop some lessons. I have a few samples here. So we want students to identify where they are now, what this means. And um, at, the, at, my, at the Community School of Naples, we actually give uh, the stamp test every single spring to students. So they know where they are in all the different modes of communication. But let's think about our role for a minute. Our role is to help our students understand their current proficiency and how to build on it. We can't just tell them what the proficiency level is. We need to help them understand what it means and how to build on it. And this is just a screenshot I made um, from some posters uh, that I have in my computer and that I have on the walls of the classrooms for my teachers. But um, these are the two that most of us teach, right? Most of us teach students in these, these levels. But looking at interpretive, interpersonal, and presentational, and then getting into intercultural with the investigate and interact, which are two important strands, right? What students can do. When you get, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this today because I could give an entire huge presentation on can do statements. But when you look at them, make sure that you look at what the novice proficiency benchmark is, and then what it goes to intermediate, and it would go further to advanced, it would go further to the, um, there are two more levels now. Um, distinguished and superior, superior is distinguished. But the point is, those are just the benchmarks. Then you've got it drilled down a little bit further to some of the um, performance indicators that they have. But you know what they can do at each level. And here's a little closer look at what I mean by that. These are some examples. So this is the overall proficiency benchmark here for intermediate. Um, I can participate in spontaneous spoken, written, or signed conversations, this is of course interpersonal, if it says conversations, um, on familiar topics, creating sentences in a series of sentences to ask and answer a variety of questions. How can I meet my needs or address situations and conversations? And we have some performance indicators for intermediate, low, mid, and high, and then some ways students can show them. And I have an arrow here because we're going to look at one of my students in Spanish two honors last year. And here I focused on I can interact with the waiter to order a meal at a restaurant. But also when she was all finished and there's a video students had to make in a restaurant, I'll tell you a little bit more about it in a little bit, but toward the end of her video, she had to film herself again at home after she was home from the restaurant telling about right here. I can give a presentation recommending something I like, such as a movie, television show, famous athlete. Well, here it happened to be a restaurant, whether she would recommend this restaurant or not to other people. So this project that my students did was really twofold. It was interpersonal because you're going to see her interacting with a, a waiter, Spanish-speaking waiter in a restaurant, and then she had to give a presentation later. So I picked out appropriate intermediate low can-do statements, although I think she kind of exceeded it a little bit. She's moving toward mid. So this is the student, and this was a restaurant project, and I always give all the instructions in Spanish. It's a restaurant project I have all written out for them with what they had to do, and that included, you know, a little introduction at the beginning, and then she, they had to actually ask the waiter or the server in the restaurant, whether they could be filmed or not. They had to make sure they went to a Spanish speaking restaurant. Well, I'm kind of lucky I live in Naples, Florida. We have quite a few of them around us, all different kinds, you know, uh, restaurantes argentinos, peruanos, españoles, we've got it all here, cubanos. So they had some choices. 
And, um, but they had both presentational and interpersonal, as I showed you. Um, I'm not going to play the whole video for you, but they had things they had to do, such as asking the waiter's name, um, ordering uh, beverages and appetizers. Once the food came, explaining what they saw on the plate. Um, later on, when they gave a little summary about whether they'd recommend the restaurant or not, I, I don't know that I'll have time to play it, but you know, this young lady talked about the music and the environment and the architecture of the restaurant, which was really cool. Yes, with mistakes, of course. She's only, um, you know, an, a Spanish two honor student and intermediate learner. Um, I tried to block her name out. Unfortunately, you're going to hear it, but I'm going to play this now to do this. Excuse me for a minute, because now what I need to do is take out these earbuds. Because if I don't, you won't hear. Okay, so I hope that it's adjusting to you here. I'm, I'm warning you. I've done a lot of presentations online, so I know to do that. So let's have you listen a little bit to this student. Hola, me llamo Caroline Rubin, y estoy en Casa Amigos, el restaurante favorito de mi madre y mi abuela. Uh, ellos sirven el mejor fajitas en el mundo. Uh, vengan conmigo. Uh, hola, me llamo Caroline Rubin, y este es mi madre, Anne, y ¿cómo se llama? Mi nombre es Juliana. Uh, gracias. Y um, mi madre quiere uh, beber um, un agua con limón. Y uh, yo también. Ok, claro que sí. ¿Y quieres algo para empezar? Un uh, guacamole, queso. Uh, ¿Maje? Uh, queso, por favor. ¿Queso? Claro que sí. Ya traigo las aguas y al queso. Okay. Sí, muchas gracias. Este es el agua de limón uh, por mi madre y yo. Y uh, este es el queso. El queso es de uh, queso blanco y pimientos uh, verdes. Y este es el salsa. Uh, el salsa es de tomato, uh, cilantro, uh, muchos uh, diferentes, varios tipos de um, pimientos también. Okay, Hola, so, me llamo oops, Caroline Rubin. Didn't mean to do that. Okay. So we are going to move on and I'm going to, I'm so afraid these gentlemen will come back outdoors here in front of me. So this is the world we're living in, right? So here we go. Okay. Okay, hopefully we're adjusted back now to where you can hear me through my earbuds. I wanted to give you a little warning. I need to unplug because I play from my own computer and you need to hear the computer audio. And if I don't unplug, you won't hear it. So now we're ready to go on a little bit. This was the project this young lady did. And you only saw a very small part of about a five minute something video. But I helped my students to see the can-do statements, to understand what I wanted them to be able to do. And I gave them the outline of what they were going to be able to do, but it was up to them to create with the language, right? That's our job, to help them see the can-do statements as building blocks. And I also showed her the next level can-do statements so they can think, my whole class, of course, they can think of maybe I want to reach for more. I want to get to that intermediate mid, for instance. Students need to understand that learning language is a process. It takes time and that you are the form right? This is kind of a building project. And all of us, actually the entire department is a, a building team, right? A construction crew. Um, here's something that I love to use. It's from the Ohio Department of Education uh, World Languages Model Curriculum. And this shows more on um, the idea of using the can-do statements. So in this case, for my students in that cl those classes that did the project, they had to think about how can I exchange information and ideas and conversations? And what it shows the difference between intermediate low to mid to high and, and so on. How can I meet my needs or address situations and conversations? How can I express, react to, and support preferences and opinions in conversations? Now, this is just one of them because remember we have the presentational as well, but just for conversations, then we have the cultural aspect down here. How can I investigate products and practices? Well, the products, you know, and practices, of course, is how to order in the restaurant. The products, of course, are the food themselves, maybe the architecture in the restaurant, music you heard and all that, but then to get to the point of making comparisons. And then how can I use my language and behavior to interact? This was a way for that interculturality. I could place my students right in a restaurant with native speakers to actually, you know, get this interculturality moving. How do I have students reflect? We're going to get into the reflection now, okay? 
first, as I said, we want to get them to understand the can-do statements and where they are, but then to reflect on what they have done and build toward growth setting some goals toward growth. This is also from the Ohio Department of Education. Although I left Ohio, um, I stayed very involved in Ohio in many ways because I used to be part of a network for regional leaders. I helped develop some model curriculum for the state. Um, we have such a robust leadership at the in Ohio that I just always went back to my Ohio roots. This is so funny, I was giving a presentation in Russia in um, actually in Moscow to the Anglo-American School of, of Moscow about proficiency. I was there for a week actually working with them. They had already found the Ohio Department of Education and been on their website. So that was kind of cool. But anyway, so I want my students, no matter what it is, and this is not necessarily for the top, the task you just saw. If you go to the Ohio Department of Education website, you'll find a lot of this kind of thing. And there are performance and proficiency um, uh, I would say reflection tools there. And this is these are some rubrics. And you notice you would choose. Now I was targeting intermediate low for the task that my students did, but this was, I'm just showing you one from um, actually it, it this is a this is a flexible rubric because you can just choose what your target level is and then look at where the student is. And um, you know, this is where comprehensibility. We look at vocabulary, language control, pronunciation, fluency, interaction. That's the task itself, content, right? Um, and, we, and I have two arrows because I love the way here we have what novice interaction might look like and what intermediate interaction might look like. And then we have the interculturality. So we have strong, good, developing, emerging, which is what these little or low, which means they're, they're not doing any of that. But I like to use these and I circle after a student does something on this kind of a, this is one a tool that I use. And you can, it tells you at the Ohio Department of Education how to convert to a gradebook score. But this is the most important part for students. On the back, there's reflection. And teachers can do this too, but I don't think it's up to the teachers to fill these out. I think it's up to the students to reflect and fill them out, try to figure where to put my face here. So what can I do, you know, right here? Where are my, what are my strengths and what are my goals? This is so important that students do that reflection. Um, these are their strengths, so this is where they're strong, and this is, might be where they're developing or emerging and they need to work a little bit. Maybe it's about the message itself, the task, maybe it's about the language control, maybe it's about the interculturality. But I urge you to, to go to the De Ohio Department of Education, look at them, because those are one kind of reflection tool that are very good. Let's think a little bit more about this. You're the facilitator, you guide and lead. So remember that uh, graphic I showed you, that picture of me with my can-do statements um, in my Ohio classroom, and I told you now I have them, the full successful actful can-dos in our school down here in the community school. Think about stating or posting daily can-do goals and have the students verbalize them. I have the students in Spanish, French, whatever the language is, verbalize them. And then build your unit or lesson using the can-dos to build student needs within the three modes of communication. So if, and I say I love in content standards because I'm thinking now of the standards, but I think about what is it, what is my communicative goal? And then I build my lesson around that kind of backward design, right? Then as the lesson progresses, they may have met it, they may not have met it, they might be just emerging, but the point is then bring the can-do goals to full circle in daily lesson closure. For example, have students reiterate, what can you do now? Que puedes hacer? Yo puedo, I, I can give advice to a friend who's having problems in math class. Ah, we must be talking about subjunctive there, right? Probably getting into intermediate, mid to high. Maybe intermediate, low though, could be, right? If it's a speaking, or writing, they're probably a little higher because I teach subjunctive in second year. I can make a decision on what to order at an online shopping site in Paris. Maybe take them to the Galerie Lafayette site you know, and they have to do some kind of a task that I've given them. But you have the students verbalize at the end, bring the, the lesson full circle. It can be done easily with thumbs up, thumbs down. I'm gonna show you some other tasks or some other ways you can do this coming up. But I think it's important to have task-related student reflection. Whatever the task is, whether it's one of these, whether it's the task, the student in the restaurant, whatever it is, have task-related student reflection. We're gonna take a look at what some of that might look like. It can be the nuts and bolts, formative kind of student reflection, exit tickets, things on the, you know that I'm, I'm looking at as a teacher. 
I want to see how they're reflecting and growing, or it can be something more summative. But remember what I said, there is no elevator. We have to take the steps. So make a plan to guide students. And the plan can be different depending on the task or the mode of communication. Um, ways that I have my students reflect, blogs, journaling, Flipgrid, giving an oral, some kind of an oral reflection in Flipgrid, just questioning in class. Um, sometimes um, on their way out the door, I have them give me one word about today's lesson or I ask them a question they have to answer. Um, it can be a quick write, writing a few lines, a thought cloud, a headline about today, can do worksheets, which um, I was lucky enough in my textbooks, we actually can do worksheets to go along with anything they were learning. But give the students some support and direction for the reflection too. Maybe something as simple as something I learned that I didn't know before, something that I still would like to know, what helped me learn today and why, what was an extra challenge for me and why, how I surprised myself. Give them a chance to shine too, show what they did well, not just where their needs are. But if you make reflection a, a regular part of the learning process, I think your students will improve much more than you think because you're engaging them in thinking about their learning. So we know how important uh, reflection is for us as educators. It's important for our students too to reflect. Here's an example. I crossed out the student name here, thank goodness. It's a level four honor student reflecting after an essay. And she wrote an essay um, where she had to reflect on the message of this. They actually saw a short video. It was La Leyenda del Espantapájaros. And she had to write an essay. And the Espantapájaros, I don't know if you've ever seen this, but it's really about, um, I guess I would say prejudice and friendship and needing other people. But she had to reflect on her essay discussing the message or moral of this short authentic film and she got to say what she does well first okay and she said she did well explaining her idea i don't know that all of you speak spanish so i'll just tell you um, she felt she used a lot of the vocabulary that was presented in the video which meant she was acquiring vocabulary she also used some vocabulary from a dictionary uh, she felt she developed a good thesis and she used evidence because they had to use evidence in the video to back up what she was saying but then she talked about what errors that she uh, plans to avoid and eliminate to improve her writing skills or and I put and or speaking. We did a lot of discussions as well. And she pointed out some things like subjunctive preterite, um, said estar accents, plural forms of verbs. She really got into the grammar. Notice that what she did well had, to, had a lot more to do with um, content, but she knows she needs to work on her grammar a little bit. This is how she reflected. Um, Often, I talk about helping, my, helping you to understand things, how to inspire students, a sampling of some reflection questions that you can use. For communication tests, writing and speaking, I have speaking in particular and culture. The what and the how. I really, and I think this comes from my AP, my strong AP background and being a table leader at the reading, looking at the, look at the task first. What is it the student was supposed to do? and to what degree did the student fulfill that task. So I like to give them reflection questions about the task and then how well, how well did they complete the task? So here's some questions. How closely did I follow the parameters of the assignment? Does my work truly reflect my effort? Have I achieved the goal I set for myself with this assignment? How's my organization? My expressions to connect ideas and manage flow? What are the details and elaboration that I provided? Now, this, of course, depends on the task. You know, it could be any task. What evidence did I cite from authentic resources? Am I proud of my work? Have I used a variety of structures and tenses? Which ones? Give me some evidence. What evidence do I show of taking risks with new structures? How's my register? Is it culturally appropriate? What thematic, rich, non-ordinary vocabulary did I use? For speaking in particular, how is my pronunciation? Am I pronouncing vowels correctly? What about my intonation, pacing, and fluency? Is there evidence of regionalisms and idiomatic expressions? And under culture, what did I learn about culture, products, practices, and perspectives? Did I establish a connection to my own culture? And how did I use what I researched in my communication? 
So these are just some reflection questions. Of course, depending on the student's level of language, when I get into, I do this as much as possible in the target language. I always do. So I would simplify these questions for Spanish two students. And my Spanish four honors and AP classes, I can ask them pretty much as are. There are also simpler ways to reflect, right? Very simple monitoring and quick feedback, which you know, you can do whether you're teaching in person or virtually before the end of class or right after a learning task, I feel good about, I still need work with. You can do this in a chat on a Zoom lesson, right? You can put the students in um, uh, breakout rooms to have them discuss what they feel good about or still need work with. You can also do on the way out the door exit tickets, which can be virtual exit tickets as well. Check boxes, quick statements, quick writes, thumbs up, thumbs down. But one thing I love to have my students do is give me a success I had today because every day should have some success for our students. And when you help them reflect on it and see that, that gives them confidence. Um, I mentioned that I'm lucky to have textbooks that have can-do statements built right into them, but you can build, you know, you can write your own. This was from um, Imagina um, from Vista Higher Learning, a series of culture readings, and they had read about Mario Vargas Llosa. And the, it's a simple can-do. I can read and identify a few facts about Mario Vargas Llosa. And they also had a singer, Tania Libertad and Fernando de Cislo an artist, and also Los Hermanos Santa Cruz musicians. And I always have them elaborate. They have more than just these lines. They write on the back, you know. So do they, they feel that they did it excelente, muy bien, más o menos, difícil, ayúdame. They reflected on what they did well. I always add a little bit to this. And this is an audio, and because I've got these earbuds in, um, this is en français, l'iPad. À la conquête du monde. And this comes from D'accord de, uh, second level D'accord. It's from Le Zapping, which always gives authentic um, audio. Um, using uh, can do language, simple, but allows for questions and feedback. So after watch, listening to this, I can understand a short paragraph about a well known news channel in France. I can understand the main idea because they read, that was a reading part in the book. I can understand the main idea in familiar sentences in an authentic news broadcast. That was the listening part. Interpersonal, discussing with a classmate this new technology and presentational, you can see what they were. And they could uh, evaluate themselves with a, a four, I was gonna say quatre, four, three, two, one, zero. And um, the auto evaluation, and again, I also, also allow for some area to write. So that's another way for students to reflect. I'm trying to show you some different ways students can reflect. Um, I would play this, but since I've got the earbuds in, I, I'm not going to play it right now. Now, this is for my AP class. This is a different kind of reflection. And this one I give, um, I can give it either after I've given them back, in this case, uh, Comparación Cultural in AP Spanish. And then, you know, sometimes a student doesn't see why did I only get a three or a four on this task? I really think I deserve a five. Well, here I have them listen to themselves. This is a two minute, for those of you that aren't familiar with this task, a two minute cultural comparison. And in this case, the prompt was, I don't know what the prompt was, but here's an example of one because I have them write the prompt up here. It's always di di um, differs. Um, how have national heroes affected life of the people in your community? And it says, after listening to my recording and considering the theme of the presentation, I have reflected to analyze my success as follows. And this is a reflection, like I've included an effective introduction. Um, in which I give my intention or an appropriate thesis statement. And they have to say, what was their introduction? I've succeeded in comparing my community with a Spanish speaking community in a clear way, explaining um, no, not only the similarities, but also the differences um, in, you know, according to the, the theme of the comparison. And they have to give what were the communities compared, the exact communities, what were some similarities between my community and the Spanish speaking community, and what were some differences. I referred to relevant examples in specific details from my past learning, my observations and experiences to compare and contrast the two cultures. And I asked for specific details because if they don't get sp give specific details on this task, even if they do a pretty good comparison, they're gonna get a three or lower, right? I've demonstrated my cultural comprehension by citing products, practices, and or perspectives of the two communities, avoiding generalizations and stereotypes. They have to give evidence. 
and so on. I won't read through this whole thing. But this is task-based with details based on the scoring guidelines. So if you look at your rubrics or scoring guidelines of whatever your task is, that's a way that you could develop something like this for your students, make them provide the evidence, and then they see why they got the score they did. But it also helps them then think, oh gosh, I really didn't give a good introduction. I didn't give an introduction. That's something I can work toward. Or I totally didn't give any specific details. No wonder my score was lower and I've got to work toward that. If that was part of the task, they need to work toward it. So we're looking at um, developing a reflection based on the scoring guidelines here. A more detailed quarterly or mid-year check. I do this all the time in my AP courses because I want to know if they're getting ready or not. I usually do them at, at semester time. Um, and I make one that has several pages. This is a clip from, from one in French. And this is a team approach. This is the student and the teacher working together. The student talks about like every task that's going to be in the AP exam, the task models and how ready they feel. What I do well, what I should improve, what I should do to improve. This one is on the um, uh, expose, the, um, uh, the argumentative essay. And this is a cultural comparison. What I do well, what I should improve, or what I need to improve and what I should do to improve. And then also, you know, what themes and context I feel I need more information. In. What I'm trying to say is this is just an example, but you could develop something mid-year with your students, kind of assessing where they feel their learning has gone, what they've improved on, and maybe what they still need to do. And what I like to do mid-year with my AP kids then is we I develop some kind of a little prescription for them. So if I had them doing um, like tablas de noticias where they have to listen and write about news that's going on outside of class, and maybe a student is showing particularly needing more listening comprehension, I might say to that student, well, you no longer have to do seven and seven, you can do all 14 on listening, for instance. Or um, I'm going to give you some practice since you say that you're having a lot of trouble with with maybe even something grammatical like subjunctive. I'm going to give you some outside practice. Or if it's more, um, you know, getting more experience on one of the AP themes, I will help the student to do that. So I went from showing you things from thumbs up to thumbs down to other kinds of reflection where student has to reflect. Let's take a look at how I had this young lady reflect. I'm not going to play it again or even play the end of it for you, but if um, I probably should find out from Linda Ignatz if I have a chance to give you the PowerPoint, because if I do, then you could play the whole thing and, and listen to it. And if I try to run it ahead, I've already tried that, and you won't get to hear the end because it takes a while to load, and I'm in the interest of time going to keep moving. But this was a restaurant project, remember, if you remember the can-dos, with both presentational and interpersonal tasks with a cultural base. Oh, dear. She just starts speaking. You didn't hear it, I don't think, but here we go. So this is the reflection tool that I developed for this. And I'm going to show you how she um, answered it. And this was a blog. I put up a blog on the school LMS, and it was La Reflexión de Mi Éxito, The Reflection of My Success, The Restaurant Project. And it says, first, watch your video and think about these considerations. Consider the content and the sections of the task because she has the guideline sheet. Consider your use of Spanish and also consider these I can do statements and you can read them, right? I can interact with others to meet my needs. I can express, ask about, react with details to preferences, feelings, or opinions. You know, that was um, the, um, where she recommends the restaurant or not. I can converse with servers in the target culture in an Hispanic restaurant. She had to consider all this. And then these were the three re reflection questions that she put into paragraph form for me. These are my guiding questions. What are you, in case you don't read Spanish, what are you very proud of? What did you do well? Are there parts of the project that you didn't do well? How can you improve the next time? What do you think about the quality of your Spanish? Very good use of vocabulary or grammar, problems with vocabulary or grammar. So this was her reflection on the blog. And I just copied and pasted it exactly as she, she wrote it, okay? And she said, I'm very proud that I understood everything that the, um, the, the server said. Also, I can speak with facility and I wasn't nervous when I ordered the food. The final scene has some pauses and the in the future, I wanna speak with more fluency. 
Also, I forgot some vocabulary words like harina. Harina is wheat. Um, I believe that the quality of my Spanish is better than last year. Although I have grammar and vocabulary errors, I have a fundamental level to communicate with Spanish speaking people. I thought that was a great reflection for this young lady. Something else that I, I mentioned that we give the stamp test every year. Uh, last year, I believe it was for me, it was the year before Avant came up with these level up help power up guides, I guess they call them. So for an intermediate low student, it tells what they can do. And these are on the Avant assessment website. Okay, I'm, um, these are on the Avant assessment website, but it tells what they can do. And then it says, do these things to power up to intermediate to get a five on the stamp. And it talks about, you know, connected sentences, grammar, um, you know, how to practice vocabulary, not to be afraid of their errors, all of that. And I have a link here, but if you go to Avant Assessment, I think these are very helpful. And I used these with my students last year for many of their tasks, where I had them use this, have a task, you know, a feedback from a task next to them. They reread whatever they wrote or listened to or whatever the case may be. And then they wrote some plans for themselves. I use this quite a bit. I really found it useful. So that's another tool yet that you could use. So um, the other thing that I do is reflection for learning, meaning um, identifying, and I'm thinking more of culture. I'm trying to move my face out of your way here. Thinking more of culture here, or maybe some kind of investigative project. So let's say we had a New Year's project, which I did have. Okay, reflection for learning. Can I identify what the student needs to investigate or suggest ways to interact? And here I'm thinking about interculturality. Sometimes we have a little more trouble. You know, language, we know a lot of things we can do to help students and how to have them reflect. But some ways they might reflect on uh, the investigate and interact pieces in interculturality. So thinking about New Year's, I had these questions. What is the importance of New Year in life and traditions of the people in a Spanish speaking community with which you are familiar? What is the importance of New Year in your own community? What are the products and important practices of the two communities that are part of the celebration of New Year? And um, a can-do statement that might be appropriate is, I can explain to others the products and practices involved in celebrating the New Year in Spain. I had a, an audio that I had them do with, you know, las doce uvas and all that. I can compare and contrast how New Year is celebrated in Spain and the U.S. from the perspective of the people who live in each community. And, you know, of course, we looked at, you know, Times Square versus, you know, being in Madrid and, and um, um, you know, um, you know, doing the doce uvas and, and all that. So anyway, um, this is one way, you, if you really have a hard time with interculturality, think of giving the students some reflection questions and can-do statements to help lead them to that. Another kind of reflection, and I think this is so important in our world language classes, is growth mindset. And I have downloaded from the internet, I found them somewhere, I didn't, this is not my work, so I can't take um, credit for it. But change tes mots et change ta mentalité, cambia tus palabras y cambia tu mentalidad. Instead of a student saying, I can't do it, how can I train myself to do it? Instead of thinking, um, I give up, I'm going to use strategies that I've learned to get better. Try to empower the students to reflect a little bit on how they're feeling. Turn every negative or every roadblock block into a plan for success. That reflection is important too. And I gave these to my students in the target language to keep in their, in their binders. And remember, um, we all want to inspire our students to go for those that uh, seal of biliteracy, global seal of biliteracy in our case. But remember that we want to show them the value of language learning for interacting with the world and help them to earn those credentials for a promising future. And as they're reflecting, they're growing the proficiency and they're getting closer to earning these credentials. This is a, just a, a picture of um, some students who had gotten the Global Seal of Bioliteracy in Chinese, Spanish, and French. Um, I, I love this quote from Benjamin Franklin, tell me and I forget, teach me and I remember, involve me and I learn, involve, engage your students in their own learning process, in helping take part in planning for instruction and also in reflection. So here we are at the end and I warmly thank you for participating with me today in this presentation about student reflection and setting goals and growth in their own proficiency. 
Um, this is my email if you ever have questions and you'd like to contact me. It has been my pleasure. I'm so privileged to have been invited to take part in this first ever global CRED. It has been a pleasure being with you. Have a wonderful rest of the conference. Bye-bye. Au revoir. Adieu.